John Major, I should stress, inherited a number of problems when he succeeded Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister on the 28th of November 1990. This inheritance was complicated by the problem of following Thatcher herself. In contrast to her domineering style, he sought to restore collegiality to cabinet, publishing the details of cabinet committees for the first time in 1994. In an era where the symbiotic relations between the media and politics had seemingly been changed forever by Thatcher, Major was also hit by the rise of what Maggie Scammell subsequently described as designer politics. This affected Labour as well, who were increasingly required, required to remake their image, but it particularly affected Major. His voice and apparent greyness was lampooned by spitting image, whilst the, guard, uh, whilst the comedian Andy Hamilton described him as someone else's imaginary friend. If things had gone well for Major, that may not have mattered, particularly if he'd been able to sustain the image of quiet competence, which arguably got him through to the April 1992 election. Thatcher's statecraft had been based on macroeconomic competence, the idea that there was no alternative, at least not one which hadn't already been tried and failed, and an image of a strengthened state and social order. The hard slog of Thatcherism with, was rewarded by the boom engendered by Nigel Lawson's ill-conceived tax-cutting budget of 1988, and the resulting boom soon had to be checked by rising interest rates. This hit those who had bought into the feel-good factors and cheapy, cheaply sold-off housing of the Thatcher period, particularly as a change to mortgage tax relief brought forth first a scramble into and then a slump in the housing market. This made even worse one of the most poisonous of Major's inheritances from Thatcher, not the party squabbles over Europe, but the poll tax. This had been introduced as a new form of local government taxation, replacing the rates in 1988 in Scotland and elsewhere a year later. A flat rate tax, it proved unpopular, sparking riots at the end of uh, March 1990, and also failed on its own terms, reducing the fiscal take of local authorities. As Chris Stevens argues in the text here, this and other factors undermined the Tories' reputation for competence, which had helped to keep them in power throughout the 1980s. At the same time, the growing divisions over Europe exacerbated these problems. Whereas Thatcher could lead a broad range of her party and indeed British industry in support of Europe in 1975, the um, consequences of the Single European Act ratified in 1987 were to lead to growing tensions amongst Tories, which were fully exploited to Major's cost by a resurgent Labour Party. Europe had been sold to the British in 1975 and thereafter almost solely in terms of economic benefits. This continued to be the case during the major years with developments such as open skies agreements facilitating cheap travel across the continent. A high point of this process was the negotiation of the single market under Thatcher's nominee to the European Commission, Lord Cofield. Thatcher felt that this would differentially benefit the British and play to competitive advantages in fields like financial services by removing non-tariff barriers and unfair competition. Talks about it had commenced around the time Thatcher secured a British rebate on the European budget at the Fontainebleau summit in 1984. Most British aims in the Single European Act were achieved, but the preamble commitment to a European currency was not one of these British aims. The commitment to a European currency 
was not a new idea. A single currency had first been envisaged uh, in the 1970 Werner Report before Britain even joined the EEC three years later. Yet its inclusion here made this aim more concrete and an explicit quid pro quo for Thatcher achieving so many of her key aims in Europe. This meant that the British were, for the first time, actually signed up to this. Thereafter, the British didn't follow closely the detail of the negotiation that followed from the single European Act, such as the opening out of capital markets, the technicalities of which were largely lost on all but the interests in the City of London who stood to benefit. So 1987 onwards marked a turning point in Britain's relations with Europe, the one which only became increasingly palpable after the single market came into force in 1992. This was that Europe went from being an economic benefit to being something more like a threat to British identity and symbols of that identity, such as the pound. This shift was already starting to become apparent in the tone of Thatcher's Bruges speech in 1988. I've included here the most notorious passage from that, though it's worth noting that earlier on in that speech, Thatcher spoke clearly of the benefits of cooperation between we Europeans. Securing such cooperation was, however, always a challenge when there were competing interests and anxieties, particularly when they seem to touch upon matters close to national self-interest. Thatcher, for instance, was notably unenthusiastic about the prospect of German reunification in 1990 following the fall of the Berlin Wall. The effects of that unif reunification were also in due course to impact disastrously on Major's government too. The key factor in this problem was the long British search for a means to ensure non-inflationary economic growth. Thatcher in 1979 had seen monetarism, control of the money supply, as the means to achieve this. By the mid-1980s, her government had concluded this was not working. Nigel Lawson, as her Chancellor of Exchequer, resorted instead to shadowing the Deutschmark, using interest rate policy to align the pound to the German currency's value. This was a kind of surrogate membership of the European exchange rate mechanism, which had been in introduced in March 1979. After Lawson fell out with Thatcher and her economic adviser, Sir Alan Walters, over this and resigned in 1989, her new Chancellor the Exchequer, John Major, continued to press for membership of the ERM, something Thatcher finally conceded two days after German reunification. I once asked Sir Peter Middleton, the then head of the Treasury, why they went in at a rate of 2.95 Deutschmarks, 2.95 Deutschmarks to the pound, arguably too high a rate. Peter Middleton replied that it had been a sustainable rate for several years before that. This was, however, without reckoning on the extraordinary circumstances of late 1990. Lawson's ill-fated 1988 boom had pushed up inflation, house prices and unemployment, forcing interest rates up to 15%. Meanwhile, German reunification was going to create similar inflationary pressures in Germany. In fact, of course, even worse, given the cost of assimilating Eastern Germany. This would have massive knock-on effects throughout Europe, threatening to push up interest rates even further and damage any recovery from the recession that, following the Lawson boom in 1991, hit the British economy as the housing market suddenly turned sour. By then, Major had moved from number 11 next door to number 10 as Prime Minister and been succeeded as Chancellor by Norman Lamont. Lamont was a long-term Eurosceptic, particularly on the ERM. 
As you can see here, one of his first pronouncements in November 1990 was in favour instead of retaining the flexibility of floating exchange rates. This did not mean that he was in favour of devaluation, an option which tended to stoke inflation and has, for Britain at least, had steadily diminishing returns at each devaluation since 1967. Inflation was what Lamont saw as the enemy of sustained growth. He deemed the shakeout and resulting unemployment from the recession as, he provocatively put it, the price worth paying for success in the battle against inflation. By October 1991, he was talking about green shoots of recovery resulting in his speech at the Tory party conference. He was probably right, though few thought it at the time. Despite the recession, the Tories were doing well in the polls, aided by the rally round the flag effect produced by the first Gulf War early in 1991. In its aftermath, Major decided not to call a snap election, one he probably would have won easily. And as the recession bit, the Tory lead steadily fell. 1991-1992 is thus, I think, a turning point in this process, one neatly captured by Nick Garland's um, cartoon shown in this slide. It shows Major jumping from a phrase he used, Britain's place is in the heart of Europe, to Britain's sovereignty is not up for grabs. And the argument between those two positions within the Conservative Party was certainly gathering around the time of the 1992 election. This election was finally held at just about the last possible moment, Major could have called it, start of May 1992. The Conservatives unexpectedly won a majority of 21, despite the unpropitious economic circumstances. In some ways, this demonstrates that Labour was still not sufficiently trusted on issues like the economy to return to power. However, Black Wednesday later in the year was to ensure that the Conservatives weren't trusted on the economy either. And that, again against the backdrop of European travels, uh, was to have uh, a lasting effect upon the Conservative Party's fortunes. They never recover until some way into the ensuing Blair government. Meanwhile, the, com the um, completion of the Single European Act led to a summit designing the next stage of European development. This was the summit held at Maastricht in December 1991. Among the various aspects of the resulting treaty was the transformation of the European community into the European Union. This was accompanied by the development of the fourth of the four freedoms of European policy. Freedom of movement in goods and services had already been addressed most recently in the Single European Act. Freedom of movement of capital was following from the Single European Act. The other freedom was freedom of movement of people. Progress towards this had already originated with the Schengen Treaty signed by France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg and Netherlands in 1985. Gradually extended thereafter, Britain resisted membership on grounds that, because it did not have internal ID cards, it needed to retain border controls. Major was, however, happy to sign up for the freedom of labour um, movement in the Maastricht Treaty. At the time, the refugee crisis resulting from the wars as Yugoslavia broke up 
had not begun, though this was to impact significantly on growing anxieties on the right in Britain about immigration as the 1990s wore on. At the time, more controversial aspects of the Maastricht proposals were the social chapter and the idea of a single currency. On the former, Major secured a British opt-out. This became a stick for the so-called Maastricht rebels to beat the Prime Minister with. Now that the Tory majority had shrunk, this small group can make things very difficult for the government, culminating in their voting with the opposition, for opportunistic reasons, on the Social Charter in 1993, a vote which went right down to the wire. The single currency was at the time less immediately problematic. The urgency of creating it had been emphasised by French Finance Minister Edouard Badladour, pictured here in 1988, even before German reunification, to give other member states some say in the economic decisions that otherwise seem driven primarily by the Germans. This logic did not appeal to Brits like Le Monde, who wanted to be able to reflate their own economy in their own way. Maastricht was nonetheless controversial in several European countries. A referendum in Denmark in June 1992 narrowly rejected it. On the 20th of September 1992, a referendum in France as narrowly supported it. These votes led to various adjustments and concessions to various member states under Britain's presidency of the European Council in the second half of, the of 1992. In other words, Britain was in charge of managing the end game of this process. The resulting agreement at the December 1992 Edinburgh summit was described by one British official as like doing a Rubik's Cube. The impending French referendum also created a huge amount of uncertainty about the um, forces for economic stability in Europe at a time when German reunification was already putting strain on European economies. Reunification had led to higher interest rates in Germany. This had been exported across the exchange rate mechanism, pushing uh, the uh, currency, the weaker currencies in that system, the British and Italians in particular, under pressure. Unhelpful remarks by German officials about the uh, pound being overvalued, which it probably was, a few days before the French Revolution, uh, French referendum was due to take place, led to um, a day of crisis in Downing Street, um, with the markets putting the pound under enormous pressure, huge amounts of money being spent to support the value, interest rates being jacked up uh, to 15%. Uh, within a few hours, and then uh, the pound following the Italian lira out of the exchange rate mechanism. Norman Lamont um, subsequently told the press that uh, he was singing in his bath at the news. After all, he'd always been a floating rate advocate anyway. The result, however, was to drive Britain out of the exchange rate mechanism on a permanent basis and to undermine the conservative reputation for economic competence. There are several ironies to this. One of the first is that the Conservatives had um, spent large amounts of public money in 1991-92 in order to claw their way out of the recession. 
after Black Wednesday, they shift policy and Norman Lamont instead uses tax rises and money supply targets in order to choke off the rise in inflation and interest rates. As you can see here, his chief economic advisor later pointed out that this was economically successful. Gordon Brown, some seven, eight years later, some way into his chancellorship, um, was proud of boasting that he presided over a long period of um, low inflation and economic growth. But that process started in 1993, not with the object, uh, advent of new labour in 1997. At the time, however, as this cartoon suggests, the Conservatives um, were not popular. There was internal uh, argument over this and Black Wednesday was very rapidly to enter the political lexicon. But one of the points to bear in mind in the context of this lecture is that it was very much against a backdrop of European development. The seismic effect of Black Wednesday politically was made clear at the Newbury by-election in May the following year. Here, a reasonably safe Conservative seat, which they'd held since 1924, was lost on a massive swing to the Liberal Democrats, whose candidate secured 65% of the vote. What made it worse for Lamont was that he had, as usual, spoken his mind when campaigning in the constituency, asked if he had any regrets about the um, singing in his bath remarks after the ERM debacle. He responded in the word of, words of Edith Piaf's uh, famous song, Je ne regrette rien. After the Newbury by-election, this came back to haunt him and three weeks later, he was sacked as Chancellor. He then got in his revenge, as describing the government uh, in his resignation speech of giving the impression of being in office, but not in power. Um, indeed, this was after Black Wednesday to be increasingly the impression the major government gave of being buffeted by external events. And this was despite the reasonable success established in terms of economic policy, which had for so long been seen as the sine qua non of successful political management, um, developed through what was termed the Ken and Eddie show. Ken Clark, Lamont's successor as Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Eddie George, the Governor of the Bank of England, who instituted a process of having monthly meetings, publishing the uh, outcomes, and thereby hopefully giving assurance to the markets about how and why decisions about things like tax rates and, and um, uh, interest rate policy uh, were being established. The steady run of by-election defeats, even in seemingly safe seats like Newbury, were only one of John Major's problems. Indeed, arguably, among his biggest problems were the Eurosceptics in his party. This is to turn to the core of the question we're addressing in this piece. But what I've been trying to do so far is establish the framework in which these Eurosceptics become a major thorn in the Prime Minister's side, partly because of the uh, election result in 1992 and partly 
because of the combination of opportunities created by Maastricht and by the um, debacle of the 16th of September 1992. That happened just as the government was moving towards starting the ratification process. And these various Eurosceptics were able to use, despite their small numbers, their leverage to cause the government major problems as they went into the end game of Maastricht. Maastricht was nonetheless ratified, but not before Major had had to um, threaten uh, to call uh, to turn the, the vote on the social charter into a vote of no confidence. Major's problems were also not just with the party in Parliament. I remember after the election, the uh, uh, veteran electioneer uh, analyst uh, David Butler pointing out that if there'd been a uniform swing in 1992, the Tories who had an 8% lead over Labour in that election should have won a majority of 60 rather than 21. That would have made Major much more secure in his position. But they lost a number of seats that they otherwise might have won with an ageing party profile. Um, they were becoming increasingly dependent upon local campaigning. Um, indeed, one of the things that political scientists noticed as the 1990s wore on was that the Conservatives who had historically been the best at local campaigning were increasingly the worst party at local campaigning. And these difficulties were compounded by financial problems at Conservative Central Office. Quite apart from the fact that these divisions over Europe were replicated in the grassroots as well as at Westminster. The group of Conservative MPs who were repeatedly rebels over Maastricht and as the 1990s wore on, on other aspects of European policies, were people who had been long-term Eurosceptics. Nonetheless, their language came to adopt a different kind of tone and arguably started to acquire a bit more purchase because it moved from a situation in which the talk was about economics, on which the opportunities of being in the EU, uh, as it became after Maastricht, um, were largely on the side of uh, Europhiles, to a language of transfer of powers to a unelected and unresponsive European order, which is the kind of language people like Nick Budgeon, one of the uh, eight master rebels, joined by Richard Boddy, who we saw on a previous slide, voluntarily to make nine, um, that regularly voted against Major and in November 1994, uh, when they were opposing the European Finance Bill, had the whip withdrawn from them. These difficulties in Parliament continued to operate against difficulties elsewhere. Um, so there's a steady run of by-election defeats, Christchurch um, being another heavy loss. And uh, one of the people who stood 
in Christchurch was a man called Alan Sked, pictured here. Alan had been a liberal back in uh, the period before um, Britain joined the EU, but in the course of the 1980s, he became in, uh, 1970s and 80s, he became increasingly convinced that the EU was an unaccountable uh, threat to British sovereignty. As he put it uh, in a debate with me uh, in the run up to the Brexit vote in 2016, we just want to be an ordinary country. To which I replied, Alan, Britain hasn't been an ordinary country for centuries. And um, it certainly wasn't before it joined the EU. But be that as it may, SCED stood in both the Newbury and Christchurch by-elections. Um, and the way in which he performed in both of those, coming in fourth, persuaded him to turn the Anti-Federalist League he'd created in 1991 into the United Kingdom Independence Party in September 1993. And he remained its leader down until after the 1997 election. A month later, Major sought to recapture the initiative and relaunch a kind of Tory narrative to replace the decay of the Thatcher statecraft that, as we saw from an earlier slide, had been falling apart by the time he became Prime Minister. And uh, to some extent, the model that was readily available was the return to a kind of law and order, uh, reinforcement of social order narrative that had been there in the early days of Thatcherism. Major even invoked in uh, part of his back to basics agenda, Orwell's image of old maids bicycling to communion and so on. Back to basics came in part from the head of his policy unit, uh, Sarah Hogg. Um, but neither Major nor Hogg were themselves social conservatives in quite the way that Thatcher herself was, let alone some of the other people in the party. Unlike right-wing Eurosceptics like John Redwood, Major was not going to go after welfare mothers or feckless um, people, uh, or, 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 or criminals or, or, or such like. Um, instead, he um, was simply invoking the idea of respect for the family and respect for the law. He was trying rhetorically to create a more respectful society. However, he had two problems. One is that this happened against a backdrop which was problematic, hinted at in Steve Bell's cartoon here, where we see a warder asleep, a reference to the uh, jailbreak from Parkhurst High Security Prison earlier that year. And so one of the things this is referencing is the idea that you know, if you want to get back to basics, get back to the basics of doing government efficiently and competently. Uh, and the other is also encoded in Bell's cartoon with Major depicted almost nude. A reference to the way in which the press rapidly interpreted back to basics as being about uh, personal morality which turned out to be a problem for the Conservative Party in the 1990s. Some crises of the major period were overcome. So there were protests across the country about culprit closures in 1992. The government 
and drew, reviewed, and generally went ahead a year later. Other problems were more difficult to resolve them. Back to basics, though it was an attempt at relaunching the conservative narrative, turned out to be very much a double-edged sword because it ran into two ways in which sleaze became one of the dominant ideas of the major government. Firstly, you get sleaze in the connection to arms to Iraq. This was um, related to the Iran-Iraq war of 1981 to 88, there had been sanctions on both combatants imposed, but in practice, the Conservative government of that period had relaxed uh, those for uh, Iraq, um, and the uh, nature of this became revealed in a trial over a company called Matrix Churchill early in the major period. The resulting controversy led to the setting up of the Scott inquiry into arms to Iraq. Major also established the Nolan Committee on Standards in Public Life, which came up with the seven Nolan principles on the kinds of standards which ought to be maintained. Standards which some Tory MPs certainly did not seem then or indeed now to be capable of maintaining. One of the most conspicuous among these was the then MP for Tatton, Neil Hamilton, now the acting leader of UKIP. Indeed, a migration into UKIP seems to have been a characteristic of many of the Tory Eurosceptics from this period. The others, however, did not become mired in ignominy in quite the way that Hamilton did in consequence of the accusation that he had taken cash for asking parliamentary questions, um, a uh, allegation which led to him being uh, heavily defeated in the 1997 general election. This did not play well with the way in which Back to Basics was interpreted, nor did the sex scandal um, associated with the uh, death of the Tory MP for Eastleigh, Stephen Milligan, in 1996, which resulted in yet another thumping Liberal uh, by-election success. All of this took place against gathering problems elsewhere, such as the failure to intervene effectively, to deal with the massacres taken place in Bosnia and later in Rwanda, both of which became major issues for um, Tony Blair, by 1994 leader of the opposition, to criticise the Conservative government's failure to maintain simple international morality. Prisons came back to haunt the government in 1995 when Michael Howard um, and his junior ministers controversially claimed that uh, responsibility for all these escapes was lay with the head of the prison service rather than with the Home Secretary. Um, a uh, somewhat dubious claim which again suggested that Back to Basics was not about re-establishing uh, 
a sense of personal responsibility for anything as far as the government was concerned. Faced with continuing carping on the backbenches, Major then called a party leadership election on himself um, and won, but was damaged by the whole process and it took place against a growing uh, series of discontents and difficulties. One example of this was the way in which uh, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy within cattle, came back to haunt the government in the mid 1990s. The private eye uh, cover here is from the tail end of the Thatcher government um, with the then Agriculture Minister John Selwyn Gummer trying to persuade everyone that British beef was safe by force feeding his daughter a hamburger. Um, when you get the first deaths as a result of the human form of BSE, Kreisfeld Jakob disease in 1995, it comes back with a vengeance and leads to a beef war within the EU uh, and particular trade difficulties with the French. And around 1995 onwards, you get a whole series of these problems. One of the ways in which the major government had uh, try to relaunch its, uh, itself and rebuild the economy was by investment in infrastructure, in particular roads. In the mid 1990s, this led to a growing series of environmental protests against these road uh, extensions. Um, the attempt to relaunch uh, the government again with a very interventionist Michael Heseltine as Deputy Prime Minister was the last throw of the dice. Whilst meanwhile the government kept on losing its majority until it became a minority in November 1996 as a result of MPs crossing the floor to join the Liberal Democrats. The previous slide was one of a number which illustrate that Europe and the resulting problems with the Eurosceptics and his party was by no means the only thing that John Major had to deal with, the only difficulty which weighed him down, the only problem which he um, had to tackle. But all of this happens against the backdrop in which attitudes to the EU are a constant source of friction. And you can see this uh, in the graph here. So when Mrs Thatcher came to power in 1979, the EU was unpopular in the UK. Once she gets her rebate, you can see the lines of those who think the EU is a bad thing and those who think the EU is a good thing cross. Support for the EU peaks around 1992, around the time of the completion of the single market. And thereafter, there is a steady decline in support. Not necessarily precipitous, although you can see a step change in 1992 with Black Wednesday. But throughout the major period, Europe is becoming 
steadily more of a problematic issue and certainly it's far more problematic in Britain than as you can see in the average EU country. John Major in his speech following the Black Wednesday debacle in the House of Commons on the 24th of September the next sitting of the House of Commons said there are broadly three schools of thought about our membership of the community. The first, spread thinly across each political party, is that we should leave the community that we should never have joined. It's a minority view, or was then, often disguised by rhetoric affirming support for the principles of membership, whilst actions speak the opposite. There are people who in their hearts would prefer it if we were not in the community. The second school of thought is that European development is inevitable and goes inexorably in one direction, that sooner or later a centralised Europe is inevitable. Those who take that view are often the direct descendants of those who 20 years ago were inevitable. The third school of thought, the one for which I stand, is quite different. It is that it is in the interests of Britain, our interests, our objectives and our prosperity for us to be part of the development of our continent. By part, I do not mean a walk on part. I do not mean simply being a member. I mean playing a leading part in the European community. I mean helping to determine the direction of policy, building the policies that we want and fighting those that we do not want. We will need to compromise on some matters, but so will every nation state in Europe unless we return to tribalism right across. Major was thus, if you like, a pragmatic European who happened to be in power when that kind of pragmatism was coming under increasing uh, pressure, both from the century petal pressures within Europe itself and the centrifugal tendencies within his own party, exacerbated by the way in which he inherited the issue from Thatcher and the way in which the debates about Europe move from economics into being about culture, identity and preserving our own institutions for the Eurosceptics and his party in the course of the 1990s. Indeed, these cultural dimensions are, I think, illustrated by the kind of uh, recrudescence of uh, nationalist language at the time of the uh, Euro 1996 football tournament held in England, in which, as was becoming a bit of a habit in the 1990s, the English team went out on penalties to the Germans in the semi-final. Europe was not Major's only issue. Indeed, a number of others, such as the poll tax, were also inherited from Thatcher. But he was as unlucky as she was lucky when it came to managing these kinds of things. He had the difficulty of trying to manage um, a period of office poisoned by growing and fighting over Europe amongst the members of his party.